today's conversation, I'd like to provide a little more background on the City on a Cloud Challenge. To honor cities and states, tapping the cloud to improve operations and citizens' experience, AWS launched an awards competition that highlights successes in public sector cloud adoption called the City on a Cloud Challenge. We started the competition because AWS is passionate about sharing the innovative and strategic work that our customers in state and local government space are doing every day. The goal of this cloud innovation challenge is threefold. First, to recognize organizations that are streamlining and improving government services and their constituents by leveraging technology. Second, to showcase those who have the vision to solve complex and difficult long-term problems through technology. And finally, to inspire other state and local government organizations to think big about new solutions that positively impact their constituents. The awarded organizations serve as beacons for others looking to transform government proving that the decision to move to the cloud is not the end of the journey, but a catalyst for transforming government, improving services, and solving persistent problems. Along the path, organizations realize unparalleled flexibility, collaboration, cost savings, and the ability to focus on program and service delivery rather than developing and maintaining complex and costly data centers. This paradigm shift allows government to share information, break down silos, support mobility, reduce duplication, and streamline processes, all resulting in improved efficiencies and better constituent services and outcomes. With that, I'm excited to now introduce our first presenters here today. Joseph Pugh, Development and Data Manager, Minnesota Department of Health, and Emily Ward, National Stockpile Coordinator, Minnesota Department of Health, to talk about the winning partnership between Minnesota IT Services and the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, my name is Emily Ward, and I'm the Strategic National Stockpile Coordinator at the Minnesota Department of Health. I work on public health emergency preparedness and response planning. So that might be biological or chemical or radiological types of incidences, including large pandemics that uh, come along. And so planning for the appropriate response to that and how to support the public in Minnesota is sort of my mission. Next slide. In order to set the background for the two applications that we meet, made, I'm going to talk a little bit quickly about what a pod is, because um, this is really sort of the, the core of the work that I do. A pod is a point of dispensing, and you can see the CDC definition is here on the slide, but basically, if something happens and you need to get medication or a vaccine or an antidote out to the public very, very quickly, that creates some logistical um, and planning issues. There's communication issues and there's logistical issues and there's um, how to get a very large population into spaces that they may not be aware of or didn't know existed before. So um, you can think of it sort of like a, a polling site when people, you know, go vote at a school or some other public building just for that one type of um, evolution, go in, vote, maybe have some staff support and then leave. A pod is very much like that, where people go in and um, get the medication that they need and maybe have some staff support to kind of guide them to what they need depending on their health history and then they leave after that. So you have to communicate um, where that pod is and what they need to bring with them and what they need to know and who should go. So um, those are some of the planning considerations that we had. You can go ahead and go on to the next slide. So here are some of the problems that we were trying to address in creating the, the two applications that we did. So the first problem is time, it may be extremely critical. 
with the COVID pandemic right now, time is not necessarily critical with a vaccine because we don't even have a vaccine yet. So um, that's a little bit longer term. But with something like anthrax, which is one of our planning scenarios, you have to be able to get medication to people within a matter of hours. So that includes setting up the site, communicating to the public, getting them there, getting them the medication, um, and that's to prevent people from becoming ill. So time is very critical. The next problem that we had is that people make mistakes. A lot of these pods are um, populated with public health staff, but they also have volunteers or other city or county staff. And, you know, they may be nervous, they may be scared, they may be working long hours. Um, the public may be nervous and scared, which can be draining on them also. So that introduces a possibility of human error when they're looking at somebody's health history and determining, should you get this antibiotic or should you get this other antibiotic? So not, not um, having human error included is one of the problems that we wanted to address also. So the third problem is we don't really have enough staff. Um, this is a very big rapid evolution, particularly in the um, with anthrax in mind, because that was our planning scenario at the time. And so pulling together a lot of volunteer or other county staff includes some training um, pieces. And so reducing the amount of training and being able to automate some of those processes are really key to being able to plug people in as volunteers at the last minute without spending a lot of time on training or without having to train them consistently over time for something that they may or may not end up having to do. The fourth item on the list is that pods are not static locations. Um, this isn't as simple as finding out where the nearest local public health office is or state health office and swinging on over to get your medications. These might be a building that they're, they have a contract with, it might be a school, it might be um, various other buildings that have the capacity to receive large volumes of public sort of in an emergency like this. So we need to be able to communicate these locations and then possibly turn them off too. If a location gets sort of overwhelmed with public or it has some sort of unexpected event like a water main break or power goes out or something, um, maybe you'd want to stop directing the public there. So we need to communicate those locations in a, a dynamic way. And then the last item is that public health departments have different IT policies and limited access to the internet, possibly, especially in rural locations. So the applications that we made, we wanted them to not necessarily have to be installed on computers because that um, introduces the, the sort of varying restrictions of different IT departments. Um, but then also we wanted to have something that let's say a school doesn't have good internet access, they would still be able to access the applications even if, um, if they were in a spot where they wouldn't consistently have access to internet. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. So the way we solved these problems was we actually developed two applications and the first one is called Pod PreCheck and I have the URLs for both of them. They're both live, you're welcome to go and take a look at them. Um, Pod PreCheck is a scalable online application that lets clients pre-screen themselves. So it, this maybe takes a minute or two minutes, maybe five, depending on um, how knowledgeable you are about medications you may be taking because there are some questions about medications. But it lets people go through and say, you know, do you have this condition? Do you have that condition? Are you um, maybe pregnant or breastfeeding? And based on the answers they provide, it gives them the best medication that they could receive. And that's for the antibiotics that are prophylactic for anthrax, but also um, plague or some other potential bioweapons. So those are for antibiotics, but obviously the lessons learned and the, the tool foundation are applicable for other medications also. And then the other application is a pod locator, and this is a dynamic mapping application. This lets people um, put in their location and find out where the pod nearest to them is, and it also lets us include some additional information. So maybe bus route, or maybe the city is reversing a direction of a road so that people can access it more easily. And so we can include some of that information and then maybe anything that they could bring with them, maybe information about translators that may be available that would sort of, 
you know, if you see one site has a translator and another one doesn't, then maybe you, you'd be able to pick the best one for you. And um, a note about the internet access, pod pre-check is something that um, once it's been accessed on a device or a computer, then if you, if you run it again without having internet access, it will continue to run based on that, um, that version that you ran previously. So that was some of the lack of access to internet that we, um, that we plan for to help some of our rural public health departments. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. So testing and implementation, how do we know that these tools work? They're both relatively new and we haven't had a large scale anthrax attack um, since we made them, which is great. Uh, so we've coordinated an exercise with another innovative uh, emergency response product and that's Twin Cities Public Television. They have an emergency response channel specifically to provide translated emergency information to the public. So we've, we've done an exercise with them and got the opportunity to test and get a little feedback on the applications that way. We've had um, some implementation exercises with county local public health departments that have tested the application. And in June, we had intended to do a statewide full-scale exercise, including 55 tribal, county, and city health departments. Unfortunately, COVID sort of got in the way of our exercise and we haven't had the great opportunity to test that yet, but that exercise will still be coming in the future. So we'll have the opportunity at some point to get that feedback and do an operational test of the applications. Next slide. So some improvements and lessons learned that we have from the applications. Um, we've updated and have now a Spanish language version. That's the second most frequently spoken language in Minnesota. So that was um, the next one to be able to target and provide a little more access for people that may not um, speak English but would still need to know the information. We've added some greater mapping scalability to the pod locator so that it could handle the burden if you know millions of people were trying to check the location of pods at the same time. We didn't want to break the system. And then added some, some help buttons to help um, people filling out the forms on pod pre-check know a little bit more information about why certain questions were being asked. We also opened up our mapping application, the pod locator, to include some of the metropolitan statistical areas that cross borders. So the Fargo-Moorhead area crosses the North Dakota border and the Twin Cities metro area, Minneapolis and St. Paul crosses over into Wisconsin. So we wanted to be able to include some of those populations, especially people that, that come into work for the day or maybe um, right along the border. And then lessons learned from our statewide full-scale exercise is something that we had hoped to have in June, but we'll um, have some time in the, the future once there's a handle on the COVID pandemic. That's all I had just on the, the overview of the applications and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Joseph for the next slide. Yeah, thank you, Emily. I am Joseph Pugh, uh, in charge of cloud application development and data strategies at the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, this pod application was part of a larger project that was undertaken during the Minnesota Health Department's journey to the cloud. We decided to migrate our entire application portfolio of 150 plus applications along with our infrastructure to Amazon. AWS specifically, all, almost all of the work was done by state personnel using a phased approach. To build confidence and buy-in, we started with architecturally simple but meaningful applications like the pod applications that Henry was just talking about. The process was do not be afraid to fail and start over and to focus on the willing. I can't emphasize enough that the reason we were successful and were able to implement beyond having an excellent partnership with our emergency response division was that we focused on people willing and excited to help. There are always going to be scores of reasons not to do something and many people ready and eager to let you know about them. We gravitated to the reasons why we should go forward and sought out people who shared that attitude. We started small and weren't afraid to fail and start over. This resulted in us being able to migrate our entire portfolio and infrastructure to the cloud and the pod apps were one of the first to make that transition. The specifics of the pod application, uh, pod pre-checked as Emily noted, is a simple JSP that initially sat on a mini server, a uh, load balance and scalable. Uh, basically, it was set on an EC2. It was written that way to allow online and offline access, assuming it was downloaded once, so we cache it so people can come back to it. This application captures the demographics and contains a simple algorithm around dosage. It is totally self-contained. 
It ultimately generates a printable form and or a QR code that can be used at the pod dispensing site to get that information and give people their doses. We've also since re-architected it just recently to be used as a serverless application that sits on an S3 bucket. So basically it sits on a file system where we only have to pay for storage. The pod locator on the other hand is a simple elastic beanstalk, more traditional application uh, built with the spring framework. It's load balanced and scalable as well. Uh, there are administrative functions to input and manage the location of the pods, and it has a database that stores that information. It is used as a means to allow people to find the pod location closest to them. We've been able to successively simulate uh, 5 million transactions in 24 hours. 5 million is the magic number because that's how many people are in Minnesota. And it had minimal impact on response time due to the scaling features inherent within AWS. Uh, none of the scaling would be possible without AWS services since we wouldn't have had the extra hardware lying around. And even if we did, we would not be able to provision that in a quick manner. Uh, the other great benefits of using AWS versus a traditional platform is the opportunity that now exists, such as running applications, like I mentioned earlier, as serverless or using an optimized database, something like Aurora instead of um, Postgres traditionally. You know, everybody asks, you know, what are the costs of this? And can you go to the next slide? And I can show you the cost for the first two years of operation. So for the first two years of operation, this is July 1st, 2018 to today, it's cost us $2,028.77. That includes the uh, exercises, that includes testing, that includes us doing a load test of 5 million users. If you look at the actual breakdown of costs, a, a lot of the costs that currently appears in the pod pre-checked will be going away because we've implemented it as uh, serverless. In the serverless model, all you have to pay for is storage, and we estimate that will be less than $10 a month versus our current charges. The other thing we're looking at for the pod locator, which has a bigger cost, if you look at the RDS, I'm doing this and I'm thinking I have control over this uh, <laughs> um, PowerPoint, which I don't. So. Um, uh, the other thing uh, we're looking at is switching the RDS to use to may maybe not even use an RDS relational database service, maybe not even use a database. Let's use some other features of um, Amazon. So we've also used this in response to the COVID uh, crisis. We've uh, repurposed some of the architecture, like the QR code, and the idea of serverless is now a common platform that we are using in our environment. So with that, thank you, and I'll turn it back to Chuck. Joseph and Emily, thank you. I'm excited to dig in more during our conversation. But first, we have Michael Schnurla, Director of Open Source Operations, Open Mobility Foundation, to tell us more about Louisville's winning public data set. Michael? Yeah, thank you very much, Chuck. So I'm Michael Schnurla. I am the Director of Open Source Operations for the Open Mobility Foundation. And formerly, I was the Chief Data Officer in the city of Louisville, Kentucky for almost four years. And I started with the OMF about three months ago. Next slide. The uh, transportation world is where the OMF does most of its work. And it's changing because of new connected vehicle types and ubiquitous personal connectivity through smartphones. It's easier than ever to get around, and I'm sure you've ridden or seen many of the vehicles shown here in the, these images. Exponential growth of scooters and other micromobility modes has happened over the last three years, and this has actually come back strong as the COVID lockdowns have eased across the world. Next slide. So the Open Mobility Foundation helps fill the gap between cities and all these new modes of transportation. Our digital infrastructure helps cities manage the public space, and we build data standards and open source software. Our public-private collaboration and cross-sector relationships help us define a shared vision for mobility, mostly in cities. Next slide. Public-private partnerships to create common standards for digital governance to transform the way cities manage. Transportation in the modern era, 
Um, this, is what, this is what we do, and it helps support a business ecosystem. The OMF is a nonprofit foundation, and we build free open source tools. The standards that we build allow cities to oversee all the docked and dockless shared vehicles in operation and the policies that allow them to operate safely and efficiently. Next slide. Over 25 cities and transit organizations are members, as are multiple private companies. You can see some of them here. We get support from foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation and the Knight Foundation as well. Meetings and code contributions are, of course, open to the public as well, so anyone can contribute um, and participate as they see fit. It, you don't have to be a city or a, a corporation. Next slide. Our core product is the Mobility Data Specification, or MDS for short. Around 100 cities use the MDS data standard right now, and most vehicle operators do too, about over two dozen at the moment, optimizing operations for everybody. All of our products are built collaboratively and in the open on GitHub and are supplemented by open forums, calls, meetings, and discussions. Next slide. So MDS is used uh, by cities for compliance and policy enforcement, letting cities manage the public right of way remotely with very few staff and they ensure devices and operators are following all the rules that are set up uh, by, the, by permit applications. This map's an example. It shows demand for scooters around the Pitchfork Music Festival, and it helped Chicago enforce a restricted geofence surrounding the event, and the city organizers could see this information in near real time and then also follow up with the operators that were not in compliance later. Next slide. The other thing that allows is digital native regulation. So instead of communicating everything by a PDF or a phone call or something like that, you can actually digitally specify restricted areas of riding, no parking areas, speed restricted areas, uh, preferred parking locations. You can do all this through, um, you could build it in ArcGIS, let's say, and then publish it through the MDS API back to the, uh, to the operators so that the city can regulate all of this digitally. Next slide. The other thing it allows is equitable distribution of devices. So um, many cities require placement of devices and scooters and other bikes as well in disadvantaged neighborhoods. So in this example, on the left is a uh, average residential property values by census tract. And you can see in the circled green area, that's where basically low income a section of the city of Louisville that has a low-income area. And then on the right, you can see deployments of scooters before these requirements were put in place. So um, instead of deploying to these areas, they're typically ignored, but the city can help through policy and through MDS enforce these new regulations and distribution requirements. Next slide. The other thing it allows for is regulation of safety and speed. Um, looking at road speed limits, popular trips on those roads, uh, riding at nighttime if that's not allowed, and where maybe street lighting is needed based on time of day and where people are riding. It also looks at infrastructure, um, where different maybe protected bike lanes or signage might be needed for all the where everyone's riding. That information comes back to the city. Next slide. Another example of infrastructure planning. So in this case, this is a real example. The purple line represents a section of road that was gonna be redone. Uh, it's a large project area that was gonna be made more safe for everybody. And the green lines represent every scooter trip in the last year of this, this time frame that touched that segment of road. So you can see, you get really good information about where people are coming to and from and what areas of town might be impacted just from the subset of information around scooter trips, which is uh, biking facilities and scooter facilities were part of this project. Next slide. So that is a lot about MDS and the OMF, Open Mobility Foundation. Uh, before I started, I was Chief Data Officer for Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so even though MDS allows this great sort of collaboration to happen between cities and 
companies, it's still, there's a lot of work to do to collaborate with the correct agencies, external partners, and get the technology set up. So to get MDS set up and working and firing on all cylinders, I had to collaborate with our five internal departments, our innovation office, which is where I stood, our sustainability office, information technology, like local land or public works department, and then work with a lot of external vendors like uh, Stay to help manage some of the data, DCAN, which is an open data platform that's run on open source. That's what Louisville uses for its open data website. NACTO and Civic Analytics Network for best practices around how to publish open data. And of course, Amazon Web Services for automating a lot of that data processing and storage. Next slide. So our open data website um, is at data.livelkmo.gov. We were the first city to publish any sort of dockless vehicle trip data. Uh, six cities have published some version of this now. We have about 500,000 trips a year. Other cities have 10 million or more, uh, sometimes 20 million of these device trips per year. Um, we in Louisville run our open data website on a platform called DCAN, which I mentioned it's open source. Um, and the question is, how do you get it from the MDS private data feeds that city gets it into an open data website like this? Next slide. So AWS Cloud really helped us with this. It helped in many, many steps in this whole across this whole diagram that you can see here. So city, as a city, we store our open data files in S3. Um, we also have a way using DCAN to pull data from that AWS source and, and process it and ingest it onto the open data website. Stay is a company I mentioned. They have a data processor which pulls in the API data feeds from the scooter companies. They're also using AWS for some of that. And then the OMF, where I work now, has open source code and tools to help process that data and also put it into the AWS cloud on S3. And then we automate that to the open data website. So our project for the City on a Cloud Award was um, this data set in particular, the open data web, uh, what was on the open data website, and also the documentation around it um, and other parts of it. I'll show you, I think, one more slide. Or maybe it was, uh, I think there was a previous slide on privacy methodology, but nonetheless, that the privacy methodology, the way that we um, process that data in a privacy conscious way and publish that code on our website and online, um, I think helped us win this award and helped us be transparent with how we collect and use data for residents. Thanks, and I'll send it back over to Chuck now. Thank you, Michael. It's really impressive what you've been able to do leveraging your open data sets. So now let's, let's dive into our conversation. Hearing from both of you, it's clear that outside of the box thinking was required to bring these ideas to fruition. Can you talk about how your organization embraces innovation? Yeah, I, I could start. Maybe it's a more clear cut fit um, because I was in the Office of Civic Innovation, which is a department in the city of Louisville. So we, the mayor, Greg Fisher, he actually carved and created that office on purpose. He, he made it happen. Um, it's been around now about, uh, let's say, a, nine years. Uh, I think we were the first innovation office in the nation, but nonetheless, that what that does, it's a very small office, very lean. It's really just people's salaries. Um, there's only four people in the office total. And we tried to connect the dots and everything. And, and the great thing about Louisville and some many other cities now is that cities allow for this innovative space, this way to take a fresh look at new problems in a cross-departmental way, collaborate with outside agencies, these new technologies, our office that actually helped us help the city of Louisville get on AWS for the first time um, and make that more of a norm within IT. And I think without innovation and, and looking at those uh, things in a 
quick and dirty, effective way where you can actually abandon problem, abandon an idea if it doesn't work uh, and be okay with that. Um, I think that's really essential and helped us move that forward. Emily and Joseph, how about yourself? How about collectively how you take a look at uh, innovation and embracing it? Well, I kind of touched on that in the uh, in my presentation. It's the main thing is to me is to form a coalition of the willing. There are always scores of people and scores of reasons not to do something. And many people are ready and eager to point out, hey, what about this? What about that? You have to gravitate to the reasons to go forward and find a group to work with that is open to innovation. In our case, it was Emily's team, given their uh, position as having to respond quickly to things. Uh, as far as the broader um, migration picture in Amazon, what we did is we started with these smaller applications to get ground root support and have successes. So once you start getting successes, people become more and more open to innovation. So as an example, you know, we moved 150 applications. If we would have just came to them with a project plan and say, hey, here's the date you're gonna move your project, it would have failed miserably. We were successful because we could point to small efforts like, not that they're small and meaningless, but you know, not giant architectural efforts and says, hey, we're successful with this, let's try this. So that's how we approached it. And my mindset isn't as um, technical with the innovation response, but I guess I try to have a customer service mindset. So looking at local public health and our tribal health partners as um, customers and knowing what their requirements are, um, looking at tools that we could build that would just help them achieve their goals as efficiently as possible. So uh, another common theme um, across both of your stories is collaboration across the agencies or jurisdictions, obviously Minnesota across state lines. Um, as a former state CIO, I can attest to how critical that is and the success of any initiative, uh, but also how challenging it can be. I'd love to hear about some of the challenges you faced when launching collaborative initiatives and how did you work through them? This is Emily. Um, so. I would say it's it's actually very difficult to collaborate with our neighboring states because the way the way our um, protocols are they're developed state by state and with some states they develop them county by county so when you're making a relatively static electronic approach or a tool your neighboring states and sometimes even within the counties in those states may not align with what your process is. So what it has really taken is, is working closely with our neighboring states to find out what are your requirements, what are our requirements, and then when we have entities that cross border, like let's say a health system chain, how are we going to support people within that health system and certainly their staff to reduce confusion and reduce the training on tools that they need and make things as, um, as efficient for them as possible while still complying with the different state requirements. I would add from a technical perspective, we also have you know, collaboration necessary between our various departments at the state of Minnesota and we have an overarching central IT department. And you know, to get collaboration, the great thing about AWS is you're bombarded with data. We can say how much something costs, you know, this is what it costs here. Tell us how much it costs to run it locally in your data center. So when people started seeing those kind of numbers, they were a lot more open to collaboration and seeing what we have to say. We have objective data. That's what I would say. And in Louisville, our, um, even though we had this innovation office and we tried to find these cross-departmental and external solutions to things, our whole model is collaboration. We never dictated things. We tried to go in and find the common ground and find the benefits for everybody and then push that innovation down to empower the local departments to do the same thing within their departments. For uh, something like MDS, um, it's really an international data standard and you know, you're dealing with different laws, state laws, local laws, national laws, 
around these uh, the data exchange, the data storage, um, and then even the rules, the policies around the devices themselves. So finding uh, consensus is really important. And the way we do it is we have this sort of online community, a formal community, which is on GitHub, an informal community in Slack and social media, and then um, more formal face-to-face. -face. We used to be face-to-face, -face. sometimes we did events, but now webinars and um, weekly, sometimes twice a week meetings where people can voice their concerns, we can get co consensus. And I think for us that finding that middle ground that benefits everybody is how we were able to move forward in both of these areas. Very informative. So now let's let's talk scale for a second. Um, one of the primary benefits, obviously, in the cloud uh, is cloud-enabled services is the ability to scale quickly, right? So since you won the City on the Cloud Challenge last December, how is your initiative scaled? Um, how do you see it scaling then in the future? I can answer this. You know, I touched on this in the presentation. The big thing was that you know it, it could scale because it's a pretty small application and it scaled effortlessly. But what we've since enhanced it to do now is that we are changing the technology to take advantage of services like uh, the serverless where your application just sits on an S3 bucket and has a Lambda function that calls it. In English, that means it sits on the equivalent of a file system and there's a little script that calls it. So that scenario, you only get charged for the storage you're using. And it's such a tiny little app relatively that you're talking about dollars per month instead of you know, hundreds of dollars. So when it scales up, you're just have, you're basically copying a file over and over and over. So that has been, wow, that's been very, very valuable. And like I said during the presentation, we don't have to provision any more equipment. It's all magic behind the scenes in Amazon. So that's the big benefit on the other side, which is the pod locator, which in fact needs to store some um, data with state. Uh, we are exploring moving from a proprietary uh, database to the Aurora, which is Amazon's database. We've also talked about not even having a database at all. Why don't we use something like a data lake structure where it can sit on a, you know, a JSON document so we've looked at all those kinds of things to help with scaling and speed of response. And we have simulated 5 million people successfully without any issue at all. From my perspective, scalability was the most desirable feature. And um, being able to tell local public health and the community that, yes, this application will still work when 5 million people try to access it, um, or perhaps more than that, if other people are just curious, um, like that, it's very important that it is stable under that sort of surge of of usage. Even though most days we're not probably going to use it at all. Yeah, and when dealing with this mobility data, scalability is also important right out of the gate. Um, you know, with Louisville, we had half a million rides a year. The other cities have 10 million or more. Um, with each of those rides, so there's a bunch of other data going back and forth and, and data about those trips. Um, and some of it needs to be processed in real time or processed for insights and action. And some of that processing happens in the cloud as well. So what I found interesting working on uh, MDS and also some former projects, open source projects across cities uh, in the city of Louisville, like with a, a Waze data processor, we're getting data from Waze. Um, but that the cloud costs were almost the same for every city because the main cost is just setting up that infrastructure. So, you know, we're running a database and then serverless databases save you money or running a, a server, but, you know, you can go serverless and use Lambda and that saves money. But the quantity of data um, coming across does not really add much to the cost, uh, you know, because of the data storage is so minimal and cost and even data transfer is pretty minimal in the cloud. So um, the cost of running a lot of these systems that we've built open source tools for for cities end up being, you know, maybe $200 a month, regardless of what city you're in. So uh, it's still scalable, you can still process more data. But the, interestingly, the costs are about the same.
So, so at this point, we've been receiving uh, your questions throughout the program. Uh, so thank you for submitting those. And uh, I'd like to take some time to answer uh, what's on your mind. So please con continue to submit those questions using the Q&A button on the right hand, hand side of your screen. First question, and this uh, seemingly goes to the Minnesota Department. Um, are you using your app for contact tracing also, uh, given the current pandemic? Um, are you looking at those options? Not for this application, no, not at this time. We, we have repurposed uh, some of the tools. We did actually look at it early on, but as Emily pointed out in her presentation, there is no vaccine for this, and that's what it was specifically built for. So we did you know, take the QR code out of it and that kind of code, the QR code and the idea that you can pre-register and go to the site with your information already in hand for your, I guess, yeah, for your site. So that's, that's what we've done with it, but we have not completely used it, no. Okay, so um, given the shared responsibility model of data, what do you recommend to your clients or customers as a data security solution? Joseph, if you want to start, and Michael, if you want to chime in then. Well, that's a big question. In the pod pre-check and the pod locator specifically, uh, the data is kind of transient and you're in an emergency situation, so you got to do what you got to do. But, you know, if you look at our migration overall to the cloud, you know, the things we did was we led with security. Every application was scanned. Any, any vulnerability we found, medium or high, we had to remedy. AWS has built-in things. We worked with a security architect to architect the networking and all those kind of things in zones to make it secure. So, I mean, I just think you just have to... Uh, lead with security, I guess that's as simple as I can say it. Yeah, and with us, we um, we had to be conscious of security as well, because even though we're not with MDS, for instance, not getting any sort of sensitive information about people and names or anything like that, it still shows movement of anonymous individuals. And so that is sensitive and we want to treat it right. So um, one great way that we handle that is we work with um, since the code is all open source, anybody can go and re review that code and find problems. And uh, we've had, I think, probably close to 100 people contribute to the effort now. So there's a lot of eyes on it. And by making it publishing what you're doing out there, uh, I think that really helps a lot with security. But beyond that, um, many of the tools that we've built that are open source that people can use that just run things out of the box, those have also been vetted for security. They're usually run through city IT departments for validation um, and to allow the proper access to just the right amount of people. Um, so I think that working with your internal departments is really critical and then validating the, the code and, and asking those questions of your vendors is important as well. Thank you both. I think that's very helpful to the audience. Um, so Government organizations, uh, as you know, are collecting more data than ever before. And at times it certainly can be overwhelming. One of the biggest challenges I see is how to actually manage this data in a way that allows you to actually leverage it into actionable insights, right? Like you have done certainly in the, in the project in Louisville and certainly in the pod concept. So data is that cornerstone of both of your initiatives. What role did the cloud play in enabling you to get a handle on your data? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I could go first. So um, I think that the best thing about the cloud is to me, in this regard to this question, is the ability to move pieces of data across different systems. And so, you know, you're getting data from scooters that go to uh, individual companies, and then that comes to a city, a subset of that. And then the city has to put a subset of that data somewhere, 
and then do some processing on top of that, and then push that out to a visualization application, which I didn't show in my diagram, but things like Power BI is what we used in Louisville to visualize a lot of the data and make dashboards and, and connect directly to the cloud data source. Um, so I think um, that whole movement of data is really important, and that's where the cloud can really benefit because it helps automate that data pipeline. Yeah, I would say from the Department of Health and speaking as at the aggregate, not just the pod apps, um, we started a data lakes initiative, always had lots of data, but unfortunately it was all siloed. I mean, AWS has allowed us to um, different ways of connecting that data and, you know, setting up relationships using services like Glue to, you know, intelligently do it. So, I mean, it's been a quite the boon for it. That is our big initiative for this year is do something with our data. And it's supported by the you know MDH commissioner and on, on down. So yeah, AWS has definitely helped with that. So another question uh, there is level of automation you've managed to achieve for continuous integration slash deployment pipeline. I can go first on that. It for the pod pre-check pod application, like I said, it's an elastic beanstalk. We have cloud formation template. We do not deploy it all the way to production yet. Um, we're working on that, you know, check it into some kind of build factory like Jenkins or GitLab and go all the way through. We have not achieved that yet. That is on the horizon. Right now we're doing stuff like, hey, let's take the uh, passwords out of the deployment bundle and use a AWS service secrets manager. So that's our initiative. We're taking baby steps. Like I've been saying, um, it's a, it's not a sprint. It's incrementally building to get there. So we aren't there yet. Yeah, for, for our data pipeline in this case, um, well, maybe more generally, one of the things I was working on most my last year at the city, which is still ongoing, is um, after having a, a warehouse is the automation of data movement um, internally and externally. And um, in, in this scenario, we had, I'd say, if I had to put a number on it, 75% of it was automated. So the, the APIs going, feeding data into a database is automated. And then um, the visualizations were kind of automated on top of that because they connected to that database internally. Um, the processing to the open data website was about half automated. And what I mean by that is since we didn't actually have to publish that data, we published it monthly. So it only had to run monthly, not in real time or anything. We would click a button to run a script and do an extract and then put that data in the S3, in Amazon S3. And at that point, that's when the DCAN Open Data website would grab that data and pull it in um, on whenever it was updated. So say we had most of it automated, and I think automation is really important uh, when you're dealing with production level data pipelines and visualizations and having the most up-to-date information. So essential, and we are most of the way there. I'd like to end today's program by leaving our audience with some concrete takeaways around how to leverage technology to solve problems and deliver better constituents of joseph what is the one thing you wish you had known at the beginning of building pod pre-check that our audience can learn from as they begin to build their own innovative initiatives So just focus on people that want to go forward, gravitate to that and start small. Don't, you know, uh, spec out everything at once. Do small steps and that'll get you there. So that's what I would say. Okay, uh, Emily, how do you maintain innovation in a time of crisis like the current pandemic? I think being able to 
have a process for collecting lessons learned, whether that's hot washes or formalizing some type of process so that you're understanding what worked well, what didn't work well, and what do you need to take into account as the situation evolves so that you can continue to provide support that's needed, um, but not also continue to give people maybe a product that's not working for them. So being able to, to make those course corrections as you get more information um, is very helpful. It was our hope to do that with the exercise process this year and, and be able to have some operational testing and then make some course corrections based on that, but uh, that'll happen eventually. You certainly will get there, I know that, um, and you'll make sure that you do that and then incorporate them. So Michael, what is the first step towards building open data sets and what is the first miles our audience should be working towards? Um, you know, it, I think you run into it, if you haven't done a lot of open data work, you run into a chicken and egg thing. So you might want to start concurrently on a lot of different initiatives. So one is you really need, I think, buy-in at the top level. So you need your mayor or someone else, um, maybe your IT director or some of the innovation office to really have that vision and that push to make it happen. So you need to work that out and then set that up into a city policy. Um, and then beyond that, concurrently, you need to find the right individuals in every department that's willing to go along this ride with you. Um, you can't do it yourself. You have to get, and basically you wanna to try to empower those people and find the right people to empower. And what we did and what many cities do is, uh, convene those people on a regular basis and show them, help find out how they can benefit from open data. So how can they benefit by reducing their workload, they're automating some system or doing a visualization or getting public feedback or reducing up open records requests, et cetera. So um, I think that sort of finding the right group of people is essential. Really the, I, the technology side of it comes to more towards the end or as needed. Um, so as you get this coalition of people and you have the right policies in place, you can start building things small, just like Joseph said, that's the way to go and iterate over that and add things as they're um, kind of, as they come up and as they're asked for by the people you're working with, whether that's the public or the internal employees. Um, and then you find the technology solutions that can help you get to reach those goals. Joseph, Emily, and Michael, thank you for joining me today. That was a really insightful conversation and especially inspiring given the global situation. That concludes our program. On behalf of AWS, I'd like to thank you, our audience, for tuning in. Today's program will be available to watch on demand and share with your colleagues soon. I hope you have a great day.